Hi, we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this webinar is being presented by the New York City Cancer Collaborative. It's on smoking cessation. We have um, five panelists for you tonight. Um, Caitlin Van Allen, who's from NYC Treats Tobacco, Pat Bax from the New York State Quitline, Dr. Fred Hirsch from Mount Sinai, um, City Councilor Mark Levine, and Jody Perth from Smoke Free NYCHA. So um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of info about what's going to happen tonight. Basically, um, I work for the Columbia Center, um, Columbia's Cancer Center in the Community Outreach Program. And uh, our cancer center, along with all the other cancer centers in New York City, have joined together to create uh, the New York City Cancer Collaborative. And we planned this event, NYC No Tobacco Week, um, a few months ago. And so we've decided to try to host these online webinars to connect people to resources on smoking cessation, vaping, lung cancer screening, and other topics related to tobacco. And um, also, I just want to say on top, on behalf of the entire planning committee, um, thank you for joining the webinar. We recognize that these are super difficult times for our communities and COVID-19 is just one of many health equity inequities that exist in the US and smoking and smoking related diseases are yet another. So um, it's important for us to emphasize that health inequities are not uh, just health disparities. Health inequities um, are not only unnecessary and and avoidable, but they're also unfair and unjust. And by holding this webinar tonight, uh, we do not want to convey that business is continuing as usual, but we wanted to hold this webinar in recognition of everyone who's listening in and our esteemed panelists, and also in recognition of the entire planning team across New York City. So um, I'd like to start us off with Caitlin Van Allen, who is the project manager from NYC Treats Tobacco, and Caitlin's going to um, start with her presentation. And just one housekeeping item before I hand it over to Caitlin is that we're going to be doing um, a question and answer session after all the panelists speak. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little box that says Q&A, and we'd like you to put any questions you have in the Q&A box. Each panelist will be able to answer a few questions after their presentation and around 730 we'll have an open uh, question and answer session. So we'll be using that box to communicate. Um, and also we have Dr. Grace Hillier who's with us tonight from who's the Assistant Director of Community Outreach at Columbia's Cancer Center and she'll be helping to moderate. So Caitlin, if you're ready, you can please share your screen. Great, thank you. Okay, and we should be all set to go. Awesome, thank you so much for joining. Just as uh, Kim had mentioned, these are certainly unprecedented times. I'm hoping that everyone is safe and healthy. Um, I'm here to talk to you today a little bit a little bit about tobacco cessation in New York City. My name is Caitlin Van Allen. I'm the project manager for New York City Treats Tobacco. And I just wanted to cover a little bit about our program just so you have an overall big picture of what we do. We are essentially funded by the New York State Department of Health, Department of Health and the Bureau of Tobacco Control, and we are one of eight contractors throughout the state. So we cover the five boroughs. However, I can absolutely connect you to anybody throughout the larger New York as well. Our overall goal is to work with healthcare organizations to make sure that every single time you go to a doctor's visit, whether it's a you're sick or um, you're going through some things, so you're going through some behavioral health help. Um, we aim to make sure that you are always given the correct and effective treatment. Um, we cover, I listed a few of our target organizations, but essentially we kind of cover it all, again, to make sure that you're receiving consistent care and care when you need it. I wanted to go over the health benefits of quitting because it really is something that's really a game changer when you look at it in certain ways. So my favorite example is not aging well, um, but I usually say as 
you are going to the doctor, let's say you come down with a cough, or in this case, you think you have the flu, we'll avoid the coronavirus for now. Um, but let's say you smoke right before you walk in the door. That first 20 minutes where you are seeking care and you are actively not smoking, you're actually already on your way to quitting smoking. So in that 20 minutes, your blood pressure and your heart rate are going to return to its normal state would you have not started smoking. Let's fast, for, fast forward to this time tomorrow. Let's say you're in the same situation, you decided to quit smoking for the full 24 hours. And at this point, your lungs are already beginning to heal themselves. And the carbon monoxide that's been built up from your cigarette smoke is starting to eliminate from your body. So there's quite a bit that's already happening behind the scenes that you're already, already doing such a great job. Fast forward again, let's say in one year, your heart attack risk is half of what it was when you were smoking. So although you, there are some very long term, they're far out into the distance, they don't seem like they're achievable, they absolutely are. And my favorite kind of fun fact about the health benefits of quitting is 15 years down the line, once you quit and you put those cigarettes down for good, your heart attack risk is actually the same as someone who has never smoked a day in their life. So that's something that's really, it's really encouraging and re it really serves as a pit of motivation so that you can kind of uh, keep up with it. What's important to note too, if you are going to start on a quit journey is that tobacco use is a two part problem. And there are two different ways that your provider is going to treat you. So the first thing he's going to look at is the behavioral aspect. So that's you physically holding that cigarette for years now. And it's actually you putting that cigarette up to your mouth and taking a drag. That in itself is a huge hurdle to get over because you're so used to doing it, let's say 10 times a day for um, several minutes in a row. Um, one thing that your provider will work with you on is that counseling piece. They may have you join a group or they may have you do kind of a one-on-one -on -one session where they'll discuss ways with you to really combat that uh, kind of habitual addiction. Um, currently, it's a little bit more difficult to go to see in-person care, but there are plenty of providers that are doing telemedicine and telehealth options, um, and they'll happily connect with you over whether it's an app or FaceTime. I've seen providers doing a few different things, but it's, you definitely still have that access to care, which is great. That second part of the recovery is the physiological standpoint, and that's your physical addiction to nicotine. So that's where your withdrawals come from. That's what you're craving when you have your cigarette. And the best form of combating that is through medications. So I wanted to go over just quickly a few of the options that your provider may discuss with you. Um, there's two kind of categories, we'll call them nicotine replacement therapy or NRT as it's so lovingly called. Um, there's quite a few options here. Some of these are available over the counter, including the nicotine patch, which is essentially a sticker that will absorb the nicotine for your skin, the nicotine gum and the nicotine lozenge. However, it's important to note that those are also available through prescription too. Um, the ones that are only available by, by prescription, the nicotine nasal spray and the nicotine inhaler are pretty much exactly as you would picture them. And they kind of help a little bit more with that behavioral health aspect, but it's, more, it's very important when you are speaking with your provider about your quitting options that you go over what will work best for your lifestyle. On the other side of the screen, I listed two of the FDA-approved oral medications, varenicline, which is known as Chantix, and bupropion, which is known as Viban. Same thing, those are something you're going to want to discuss with your provider of the, what's the best method. Um, there is a schedule that you'll have to adhere to in terms of when you take your medication with these oral medications, um, but that's something that I encourage you to speak with your provider about. I also wanted to point out because it actually, New York is such a great state and the New York State Medicaid plans cover all seven FDA approved medications with a prescription. So those are available at little to no cost to you. But what's great too is that combination therapy is also covered and that consists of 
multiple nicotine replacement therapies. So, for example, we could do the patch in the gum or the lozenge in the gum. So you can really tailor a system that works for you and that's successful. But again, speak to your provider. They're more than happy to discuss your options with you. Another great thing is that both group and individual counseling is covered under New York State Medicaid. So whether it's telehealth or it's in person, that is covered, you are able to get those resources. I also want to point out the New York State Smokers Quit Line, who Kim mentioned, would also be speaking a little bit later on. They occasionally have a limited supply of the NRT um, for eligible participants. So I'm sure Pat will go a little bit more into that um, coming up, but that's another phenomenal option that we recommend to our patients. I also wanted to touch briefly on smoke-free housing because so many New Yorkers, we live so close to each other and in such close proximity. Um, so secondhand smoke is very much a concern. And secondhand smoke is essentially what is emanated from those cigarettes that non-smokers may breathe in. There are just as many risks associated with it, and there's ju just as many chemicals that you are taking in as a non-smoker. And because of that, smoke-free NYCHA and smoke-free public housing have been developed and have been put into place. And these are just policies to make sure that residents health is protected and they are breathing cleaner air. Similarly, Jody Parth is on the line. She'll be speaking a little bit more about smoke-free NYCHA. So to avoid sounding like a broken record, I'll let her take that. But essentially, the smoke-free NYCHA eliminated uh, smoking out of the equation, which is phenomenal. We work with several key healthcare organizations throughout the city, making sure that if you do need that help, whether you're under a stay-at-home order or your lease agreement has changed, you can go to a provider to help. And I wanted to reiterate that NRT is a phenomenal resource for that, for managing those cravings. Also wanted to highlight a few available resources. There's local quit programs that are available through NYC Quit. There's phenomenal resources there. And there's a list of cessation programs that are available where many of them are actually switching to telehealth as well. So you can get care now or you can get care later. Again, the New York State Smokers Quit Line is more than available. And again, Pat will go into that. But there's also a few texting programs and apps, including smokefree.gov, where you can get a tailored texting program to remind you, here's some triggers, try this. So it gives you a lot of quick tips. And there's also the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Help Me Quit app, which has quite a few phenomenal tricks in there, um, whether it's keeping your mind off of things while you're having a craving or joining a larger community. So there's so many great phenomenal resources that are available in our city and state that I just wanted to highlight here. And thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions coming in right now in the QA box, but I would encourage our attendees to please um, use the QA box to put any questions that come to mind. And um, we can, if you have a question for Caitlin, we can return to her um, during the QA session. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, Caitlin. That was such an informative presentation, wonderful. So I think we'll be moving on now to uh, Pat Bax. And Pat is the marketing and outreach coordinator for the New York State Smokers Quit Line. And she's based out of the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, Anushka, I'm gonna ask you to share your screen. And Pat, are you, are you ready to present? I'll unmute you. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for having me here today. It's really an honor to be with you. I also want to welcome everyone who's on the call with us this evening. And thank you for taking time. This time that you're spending with us is really a recognition that you are taking time out of your day to be with us and to learn and to educate yourselves about the resources in New York State that are available for tobacco dependence treatment and smoking cessation. What I'd also like to say is I hope everyone is staying safe 
and healthy during these challenging times. We've all had a long day, so let's do a little physical activity. You don't even have to get up from your chair, but I'd like to invite you to join me in this. This is completely optional, but if you could raise your right hand up in the air, give yourself a little stretch, and then your left hand up in the air, give yourself a little stretch, reach behind and give yourself a pat on the back. My name is Pat Bax, and it's an easy way to remember the information that I'm going to present, and I hope it's also a fun way to do that. So tonight what I'll be talking about is basically my information is geared to someone who is really thinking about quitting smoking, or maybe you have quit and you're struggling with the quit process, especially with all the stress we're going through right now. But good for you that you have made that decision to quit because it is a courageous step and you are not alone. It's one of the best things that you can do for yourself. And obviously, as you know from those in your family or friends that have encouraged you to quit, they'll be happy to support you in the quit process. You are empowering yourself to be on a journey of quitting. It's a really powerful journey and you're going to learn a lot about yourself as you take this quit journey. And you're making this meaningful change because you are doing it not just for yourself, but for those that love you and that you love as well. So how you decide to quit is really going to be determined by you. You are taking control of your decision to become and stay tobacco free. And it's a unique journey. And there may be some curves along the way. It's not always going to be smooth. It won't always be perfect. The important thing to remember is that this is your path. And tonight, you're going to learn of all the resources. And Caitlin's already described many of them to help you find the best path and start your journey to be successful in quitting. Now, for those of you that are thinking about quitting, or if you have quit and you want to try to start again, or if you're on our webinar tonight as a healthcare professional or a community member, all of us have made some behavior change at some point. I'd like you to think about a time in your life, and it might be right now, tonight, that you have decided you're going to make a behavior change. What did that feel like for you to make that initial change or make that decision. What do you need to do to make those steps? Some of you may be planners. Some of you may be procrastinators. Some of you may feel like you need a lot of support. Whatever behavior change that is, and tonight we're focusing on quitting smoking or tobacco use. For some, it might be losing weight increasing your exercise, whatever it might be. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about the quit process. Now, what I'm going to focus on is the support that you have tonight, and that's through the New York State Smokers Quit Line. And that support is beyond tonight. You're gonna to learn about it tonight, but we're here for you to help you all across New York State. So what do we actually do? We have services for both what we call the traditional tobacco user or someone who's using combustible tobacco and also ENDS users, which include what we call electronic nicotine delivery systems. Our services are free. We will make up to two what we call proactive coaching calls. We'll reach out to you to offer coaching sessions. Our quit coaches are trained to help motivate you, to help to tailor their coaching and support for you to be successful. And you can call us as many times as you want. And we do have people that call every day just to say they're doing well and thank you for the support that the quit line provides. Caitlin mentioned in her presentation that we provide free nicotine replacement therapy. Now what we provide is a starter kit. And if we can just go back to the slide again, please. We provide a, thank you, a starter kit to get you started on your journey. We provide 
self-help materials that we can mail to you or also you can download them from our website at nysmokefree.com. If you are a healthcare professional on the call this evening, we have a specific host of resources, really a plethora of resources available for you to help your patients. And we also have a very robust referral program and you can contact us at nysmokefree.com for more information about that referral program. If you're a family member or a friend that's wanting to find out how can I help my friend or family member who is a tobacco user to be successful in quitting, you can contact us as well. Because we provide just a starter kit, we want to also link you to the additional services in your area. And as I said, we cover all of New York State. So those services might be your health care plans, or it could be a local program that is happening like cessation classes, or maybe a particular cessation event that's going on. Now, what qualifies people to receive the free nicotine replacement therapy? We follow what we call the, the guidelines of the manufacturer's recommendations. So for individuals who are calling us, to receive the free nicotine replacement therapy, you must be 18 years of age or older and a New York State resident. That doesn't mean though, if you're younger than 18, you can still pick up the phone and call us for coaching and support. You can have any medical contraindications, which means that if you have had a recent heart attack, for example, that being said though, we can work with you. So if your doctor has referred you, we can talk with your doctor about getting permission to still send you the nicotine replacement therapy. So most of the people that do call us are eligible. And currently you can receive a two week supply two times in a 12 month period. And it has to be three months apart and it's based not on a calendar year, but from the time that you call us. And we are open from nine to nine Monday through Thursday, nine to five on the weekend. We also have bilingual coaches and we also use a language line with over 27 different languages. If you are a moderate or heavy smoker, you may be able to receive what we call combination therapy. So you may receive the patch for a longer release of nicotine, a longer term release of nicotine throughout the day and gum or lozenge, which is considered short term nicotine replacement therapy. Now the amount that we have varies depending on, as we're funded through the New York State Department of Health, depends on our supply and oftentimes in New York City, we will have extra product to be able to send you. Next slide. One of the other programs that we're very excited to have to offer is a program tailored toward young adults and ages 13 through 24. It's, it's our This Is Quitting program. We partnered with the Truth Initiative and you just have to text drop the vape to 88709 and you'll receive a text support message. The drop the vape at 88709 will also provide you with linkage to the New York State Smokers Quit Line. Next slide. Here's a screenshot of our website. And I used to be a teacher, so I'm gonna give all of our listeners and participants tonight a homework assignment to go visit nysmokefree.com and really take time to look through all the different resources that we have available. And as you can see on our next slide, this gives you an example of the menu of choices that we have. Things like how to quit. If you're thinking about quitting, how do I talk to my doctor when I go to my visit? I'm afraid, I don't know what to say. And we have support and messages for that. What to expect. We also address smokeless tobacco too. If you have questions you'd like answered and lots of tools and resources. On the next slide, you can see that there's other subsections that we provide for you. For example, under staying quit, talking about 
individuals that maybe struggle, if you've tried the first time, what can help you be successful? Because quitting is a journey, as I've mentioned several times. You may not be successful the first time you walk down that path, but you can be successful with additional support and maybe changing that path up a little bit. Next slide. So what happens when you call the quit line or your healthcare provider says to you, I'm not gonna quit on you. I'm gonna support you in being successful. So what happens when you get a call from one of our quit coaches or you call yourself? Regardless of how you enter into the quit line, on the next slide, describes a little bit about what happens in a quit line coaching session. We talked to you about your motivation, your readiness to quit. You may feel ready to quit, but maybe your confidence level is a little shaky. Maybe you've tried several times, but you haven't been that successful. Our quit coach will tailor the coaching and support to meet your needs. Looking at some of the triggers. Right now, one of the biggest triggers that we're hearing from our participants who are calling us is obviously stress. People want to quit, but they're afraid to quit. They don't know how they'll handle stress during this difficult time. Our quit coaches can help you identify situations where different techniques would be very helpful. We also wanna work with you to set a quit date within 30 days. We don't wanna send you the product and then have it sitting there on the shelf. We want to be able to help you set a date and I like to look at it as a new beginning. This is your new birthday. This is a wonderful day for you to start a new life. And that's a day to celebrate. You know, quitting smoking shouldn't be punitive. It should be celebratory. This is the best day that you can have. And then your quit plan, identifying what we can give you in terms of free smoking medications and support. So what does it come take to become tobacco free? Really, all you need to do is have a desire to change. And planning precedes performance. So obviously with your quick coach, you can help to identify what are the triggers, what are things that maybe are stopping me from my quit journey. Things like maybe instead of having coffee, maybe switching to tea because coffee is a trigger for you. How do we reduce stress together and how, because we all know that stress is a big issue right now. But readiness to make some daily changes. It doesn't have to be monumental. It could be just a baby step. That support, it could be family support. You know, think of it as kind of a quilt that covers you in the support you have from your healthcare professionals, the quit coaches, and all the support that's available for you throughout New York State. And to understand that this is a process, and you can see in the next slide, one of my favorite things to remind folks about is that change is a process, it's not an event. And if you don't succeed the first time, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and try again. Take whatever lessons that you've learned from that experience and say, well, what can I do differently? What did I do that was helping me the first time? And how can I take that into the next steps? Now, we will have some time for questions at the very end, but I want to remind you about our contact information. So you can see that on the next slide, I have my phone number, or I'm sorry, my email address and our phone number for the New York State Smokers Quit Line. And, and I strongly encourage you, we're open till nine tonight, so after the end of this webinar, if hopefully I've motivated you to give us a call, you can call us at 1-866-NY-QUITS. You can also email me, if you're, especially if you're a healthcare professional, and I'll be happy to assist you with our referral program. Thank you so much and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much, Pat. That was so wonderful and informative. Um, I do see one question in the QA box that I think was um, for you, for actually for Caitlin, um, where can someone in Suffolk County receive similar info? Um, so I think maybe Caitlin can answer that after in the panel. So we'll go back to that. But does anyone else have questions for Pat that they want to ask right now? 
please put it into the QA box. And um, we'll be able to share a recording of this webinar. So uh, we'll have that up on our website and we'll send that around to all the attendees. So I don't see any other questions coming in at the moment, but thank you so much, Pat. We really enjoyed your presentation. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to Dr. Fred Hirsch, who he is the executive director at the Center for Thoracic Oncology in the Tisch Cancer Institute at Mount Sinai. And he's also a professor in the Icon School of Medicine. Dr. Hirsch, I'm going to make you in the spot. So turn it over to you. Are you ready to begin? I am ready. Thank you. And, Thank you. Um, I hope everyone can see me. I hope everyone can hear me. And uh, welcome uh, to everyone. I will give you a break in uh, the slide viewing. So I will talk uh, with you a little bit about lung cancer, lung cancer prevention, lung cancer screening, and uh, COVID and lung cancer. So um, I happen to be a lung cancer expert, but not particularly smoking uh, expert, uh, but I had to deal with it as a, a CEO for the uh, World Lung Cancer Organization for many years. We have had a very active um, committee around the smoking, smoking cessation. Now, uh, we know that uh, lung cancer is a huge health problem in the United States and globally. Globally, 1.8 million people are hit by lung cancer every year. In the United States, uh, 230,000 people are uh, hit by lung cancer, diagnosed with lung cancer. And unfortunately, uh, as of today, uh, around 165,000 people per year in United States will die of the disease. There is a lot of progress in the treatment arena for this disease, which will be for another webinar. Uh, but uh, that is uh, the magnitude of uh, lung cancer in the United States. And um, lung cancer is um, we, 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 uh, we estimate that 80% of the lung cancer cases or are caused by uh, tobacco smoke. So uh, that leave 20% uh, left to never smokers. And uh, the reason for the never smokers is uh, uh, very much unknown these days, but we know a lot about smoking and smoking damage uh, in the lung and uh, particularly uh, tobacco smoke. So um, is lung cancer um, preventable? The answer is clearly yes and uh, appreciate all the efforts we are putting into smoking cessation, smoking prevention, and um, education cannot start early enough. It needs to start uh, in the young school age and uh, continue through the younger age because uh, that is probably where the uh, smoking habits are starting um, in among youngsters um, in, in colleges, even in high schools, etc., uh, etc. Et so, uh, lung cancer is 
uh, preventive uh, to uh, a large extent. Uh, can it be diagnosed early? And is that related to smoking? Uh, the answer is yes. We do have lung cancer screening uh, these days, um, and lung cancer screening um, has actually, it was actually started in New York. Uh, the group is now at Mount Sinai. Uh, they started lung cancer screening with low dose CT. And uh, large studies uh, initiated and supported by the US government has demonstrated that for patients in high risk for lung cancer, and what does that mean, high risk for lung cancer? That means people in the age of 55 to 80, current or former smokers with a smoking history of uh, 30 pack years. In this group of patients or, per, or individuals, they might not be patients, but they, and they are not probably patients, they are high risk individuals. If you do uh, lung cancer screening with low dose CT, you reduce the mortality of lung cancer with 20% shown in a large study, including 55,000 people in the United States. Half of them had a low dose CT screening, half of them had conventional X-ray screening. And, the, and you reduced a low dose CT, you reduced lung cancer mortality with 20%. Uh, that is significant. And that led to CMS approval and recommendation for lung cancer screening in this high risk group. Now, has this been validated in other studies? The answer is also yes. Uh, most recently, we learned from a large study in Europe. It's called the Nelson study, which was organized in the Netherlands. And the Nelson study um, randomized uh, people, high-risk individuals. They, uh, they went lower in age. They went down to 50 years old. And uh, half of them uh, got um, low dose CT, and half of them did not get any uh, CT screening. Uh, and you reduced the lung cancer mortality with 26% in men, and even much higher in females. Unfortunately, there was the female population in the study was so much smaller that uh, it is difficult to uh, use uh, the female data exactly. But it was clearly that there was a significant reduction in lung cancer mortality using lung cancer screening. And as I said, in the European study, the age was from 50 and up. So um, uh, CMS, the US government, the prevention, um, US preventive um, cancer task force uh, recommended introduction of lung cancer screening. Uh, unfortunately, and that is in my opinion very unfortunately, only today, only four, three, four percent of individuals in this particular risk category 
under a long cancer screen. We need to do something with that. We need uh, to um, have a much better implementation of lung cancer screening. Uh, it is debated how that can best happen. Currently, uh, most of the places uh, the screening goes on in the hospitals and institutions. So the the population need to come to the hospitals for undergoing lung cancer screening. I am a believer that uh, might be a better way would be if the lung cancer screening come out to the population. And there are efforts today using mobile uh, screening vans and, um, and um, have screening places out in the communities where it is much easier to access lung cancer screening. We need to come out there. We need to reach out particularly to underserved populations. That is where the need is most. And, um, and we we, uh, we need to put a lot of effort, education, and resources into this. Because, as I said, the data, the results, are amazing. And again, in the United States, 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. In a large European study, uh, even more than 25% reduction in lung cancer mortality by lung cancer screening in this risk group. Now, does this risk group though, uh, cover all the lung cancer patients? And answer is no. What about all the patients below 55 years old who get lung cancer? What about never smokers? Uh, I know this is a smoking seminar, but still, uh, as I said, 20% of lung cancer cases are among non never smokers. But uh, still, there is most of the lung cancer cases uh, fall actually outside the CMS recommended risk group today. Why isn't it recommended in other age groups, other a group of people? Because we don't have the data. We don't have the studies yet. We need more to do more studies uh, in populations which is not included in the 55 to 80 years old group with 30 pack years history. So um, there is a lot of work to do still with lung cancer screening, but even, as I said, even in the recommended high-risk group, only around 4% of the individuals undergo lung cancer screening. What can you see on lung cancer screening uh, with low dose CT? Of course, we detect lung cancer earlier, which is a main purpose. But believe me, you can also, with new technology, detect heart diseases and other diseases uh, on the same time. So, might be that is where we move in the future, uh, not only detecting lung cancer by low dose CT, but also as a prevention to uh, heart disease. And there are good data for that uh, already uh, in hand. So that was about lung cancer screening, high risk population, uh, what have we learned so far with uh, COVID and lung cancer? 
unfortunately, all the data we have, and it is still preliminary data because we haven't had so much experience yet uh, to analyze all the data for lung cancer patients and COVID. But unfortunately, we see that the fatality rate of COVID and lung cancer in combination is very high. It was a few days ago reported at the a big convention, American Association for Clinical Oncology, ASCO. It was a global registration study of 400 patients with lung cancer and COVID. And the fatality rate in this group was 35% which probably is higher than for many other cancer patients. So what does that mean in the future? Well, it could mean that a specific preventive measures or research needs to uh, be taken around cancer patients in general, but particularly lung cancer patients uh, um, and uh, we are at Sinai and um, other places thinking how those research programs can be designed in order to get a better prevention uh, program for uh, patients and fam patients with lung cancer and families uh, within, with, around those patients and the environment. So what we have learned so far, lung cancer patients are susceptible for COVID infection and when they get it has been very high, as I said, as, is 35 percent in in the large study recently presented. So um, around lung cancer, uh, again, lung cancer is unfortunately a huge health problem in the United States and globally. It is preventable. Most of the lung cancers are caused by smoking. We all know that. So there needs to be uh, emphasis and strong emphasis in smoking cessation and educational aspects, particularly in the younger age. I'm happy. I think I have used my time. Uh, I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions uh, either here or uh, my email is not on the screen either but it is fred.hirsch h-i-r-s-c-h at m-s-s-m Mount Sinai School of Medicine m-s-s-m dot edu so again, thanks for being invited and give this input in this panel uh, discussion. Kimberly? Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Hirsch. We really um, appreciate your comments about the lung cancer screening and the importance of that for current and former smokers. Um, so I'm going to turn it over now to Jody. Um, and Jody's going to be, Jody Parth is with us from um, Smoke Free NYCHA. She's the Smoke Free NYCHA administrator. Um, just give me a moment. Jody, I'm going to ask you to share your screen when you're ready. And um, then we can start. Okay, good evening, everyone. Hopefully you can see my slides. 
and hear me okay. I wanna thank you so much for including me in this important conversation um, and to be part of such a great group of panelists. So I am going to take the conversation a little bit more local um, and talk to you about what's happening at NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority. And I'm sorry, just one second. Go, okay. So um, many of you might be familiar, uh, but HUD implemented a federal mandate that all public housing authorities must be smoke free as of July 2018. Now this specifically prohibits the use of cigarettes and um, uh, other prohibited tobacco products indoors. Um, so that includes all resident apartments as well as on NYCHA grounds, including 25 feet um, from building entrances. So uh, you can imagine in a city as dense as, densely populated as ours, this, this is a real challenge. Um, to give you an idea, a little bit more context about NYCHA, we are the largest public housing authority in the nation. In fact, we could be our own little small city within a city, um, serving over almost 400,000 authorized residents. And essentially, one in 15 New Yorkers identifies as a public housing resident. Um, we have in terms of the geographical scope, we are spread across five boroughs, as you know, um, but this is over 2,000 residential buildings across 316 individual developments. Um, we also have over 10,000 employees, and it's interesting to note that 22% of those employees also identify as NYCHA residents as well. So this issue hits particularly close to home in multiple ways. So, you know, Smoke Free NYCHA was an initiative created in direct response to the HUD mandate and is based in the Department of Health Initiatives. And really our goal is centered around a mission of creating healthier homes for public health residents, I'm sorry, for public housing residents, as well as NYCHA employees. You know, and to do this, to achieve this in a successful, meaningful way, we knew from the beginning that this would really require broad engagement of not only residents and staff, but also our local partners as well. And that any decision making and action steps really had to be driven by that collective input. Um, as it was stated earlier, Pat, thanks so much for putting up that that great slide. That you know, change is is a is a journey um, and a process that takes time. So that we really want to set the expectations that we are not going to see this change happen overnight, but that this will be a gradual process. Again, driven by by thoughtful, actionable steps. And that really we need to keep the big picture in mind, which is that this is all about creating healthy and sustainable housing. So, you know, to begin this process, we really um, knew that we needed to start with engagement. Um, learning and listening are really the keys here. And to do that, you know, we, we really uh, went right to our residents and held a series of community meetings, hundreds of meetings um, focused on this issue, but really wanting to give residents the chance to provide their feedback, to ask what are their thoughts. You know, there's a great picture at the at the bottom left, which was a hands-on activity at one of our, um, you know, uh, resident-based events, a uh, family day, as it's known, um, where residents were able to identify what what was important to them, what issues um, they felt we needed to focus on. You know, I mentioned before that this needed to be a collective effort, and that's why we formed an advisory group that included not only residents, but as well as our local experts to really make sure that we were incorporating all sides of this issue into our action steps. Um, and then we also initiated some community health worker trainings through our, our partner organizations. So the engagement strategy continued on into the next year where we focused heavily on outreach to community residents. At this point, we were able to leverage some, some partnerships um, and some organizations uh, to really start um, doing some door-to-door -door outreach. Um, and really, I'm sorry about that, that in case that, that message just popped up. And we also were able to launch the first Freedom From Smoking um, group, which is a, a product of the ALA. Uh, one other really neat effort that came out of this um, engagement was a youth-driven video project, which I really encourage you to go to our website, um, our NYCHA website, and find that video. It is, it's, a, it's lengthy, but it's really worth watching um, as it gives a really um, great inside perspective as to how residents feel, particularly the youth feel, about um, tackling the smoke-free policy. 
So as we moved into 2019, our strategy started, started to turn inwards and we really wanted to focus on our operational end of, of um, getting this policy off the ground. And that included um, uh, bringing on full-time staff, myself included, as well as a full-time analyst focused on the enforcement piece of this effort. You know, from that advisory group came this amazing smoke-free nature guiding principles for implementation. Again, this is available online to you for viewing. Um, many of you might be familiar with the Work Well programs, the wellness initiatives um, that are available for New York City employees. Again, not NYCHA specific, but any New York City employee can take care um, advantage of the ESCAPE program, which is a tremendous resource offering free NRT as well as counseling for eligible employees. Um, we were able to start this process here at NYCHA, bringing these clinics on site um, to our developments. I'm happy to report that this has been so well received. And um, thanks to Mark Bansfield and his team, we have been able to continue that effort throughout 2020 um, and excited to keep that going. Uh, we also, have you know continued the storytelling process. I mentioned the video generated by the youth, but we wanted to also capture the perspective of both residents as well as employees, again, to, to really bring home the message that this is a journey, um, that it doesn't have to be an overnight process and that there's no fear or shame in sharing our stories and that collectively we can help empower each other um, and by sharing our progress or challenges. And so we've been capturing those um, stories via video as well as through emails, um, depending on, on how individuals are comfortable sharing their stories and we'll begin sharing that online um, and in other forums. So, you know, again, this year, really, this past year focused on, on strengthening our operational aspects as well as our community partnerships. So what's next for us? Um, obviously, resident dialogue remains at the forefront. Um, in order for this policy to really be sustainable, um, it needs to be something that residents feel empowered to take on. You know, I know many of us remember when the bars and restaurants were not smoke free and now to look back on that, it seems um, crazy, right? So, you know, we believe that this will really take hold and that we too will look back in, in many years and, and say, wow, can you ever remember a time where people were allowed to smoke inside of their apartments or wanted to? Um, next is also training um, for not only our residents and our leadership, and, and that is going to be an ongoing process as well. As we move forward in this process and, and add new pieces to it, we want to make sure that both staff and, and residents are equally informed and that there's an opportunity to ask questions and for us to, to be able to use that feedback to refine our processes. Um, we are in the process of completing signage across all of the NYCHA developments, you know, making sure that that signage is visible, that it's correctly located, and that again, that residents and employees understand um, its purpose and that we're, that we're monitoring that quality assurance throughout. Um, and clear, consistent enforcement process. I do want to emphasize that, you know, that that is, that is an important part of this piece, but really we want to emphasize that this is not intended to be a punitive approach and that we really wanna focus on um, building a healthier environment for everybody. And, and lastly, we're excited to talk about the launch of our community health worker program. And, and that is what is going to be known as a smoke-free NYCHA liaisons. And this is really built around the community health worker model, which is, um, I'm sure for those of you who are familiar, is, is based on a shared cultural experience between the provider of the services and the recipient. And so we are currently in process of hiring NYCHA residents to support this role. And so the majority of this team will likely be NYCHA residents um, or those that have a personal experience with, with NYCHA or, or history. Our, our team will have six full-time liaisons as well as a full-time supervisor. And this will be um, really a, a, a opportunity to connect with residents directly to, to do two things. Um, one is to provide one-to-one -one cessation support, you know, uh, to be able to provide coaching strategies on how to quit or reduce their tobacco use. We'll also be linking um, residents to resources like the quit line, which Pat so beautifully outlined earlier, um, and as well as our local health clinics who are providing more intensive services. So resident engagement will really be at the forefront and this team is, is intended to be out in the developments communicating with residents. 
Um, of course, I just want to uh, point out that in the current pandemic circumstances, you know, we are implementing this, or we will be implementing this work remotely. Um, and we know that that can be successful learning from our other colleagues across the country who are, are doing similar efforts and, and seeing a really positive response. The other piece to the community health worker model is um, what I like to call the, the cheerleaders for the policy, really being that advocate, making sure that residents and, and community members understand what the policy says um, and how best to, to comply with that. So that'll be done through training and education, um, community-based advocacy events. And in terms of when we're planning to launch this, we're looking to do this as soon as possible. We are aiming for a July 1st uh, start date and, um, and stay tuned for more information. And you know, in terms of how we're going to begin our efforts, we really thought long and hard about this and felt that it would be best to focus on one borough or one area, geographical area at a time so that we could come so that we could create those deep, really, you know, penetrate the community and create those sustainable connections. So um, I'm just before I before I end, I also do want to share that we are continuing our resident dialogue and and doing some some really exciting outreach around creating um, resident volunteers to also support and complement the work that the liaisons will be doing. And again, I want to put a big plug in and and thank you to the escape team who's really been an instrumental resource for our employees and happy to take any questions as they come. Thank you so much, Jody. That was wonderful. I'm checking our QA box. Does do any of the attendees have any questions for Jody? Um, I'm not seeing anything coming in at the moment. So I think. Um, we can, we can just pause for a brief moment. I know that um, some people are doing their cheer for the healthcare workers outside and we, we'd like to just acknowledge that. Um, so we'll just take a brief pause now. Okay, I'm coming back on. Um, I think that we have um, Councilman Mark Levine joining us. Um, Mark, are you there? I don't see him right now. Um, so while we wait for Mark to join, um, I did see, I did have a question come in from a colleague for Jody, Jody, do you know? Um, let me see. Where, what area um, you're planning to launch your work in? Anushka, did you want to voice your question to Jody so that she, you can clearly articulate it to her? Yeah. 
Hi, Jody. So I know you're starting in specific areas, and I was just wondering what areas you plan on launching. I'm glad you asked. Uh, so we are actually planning um, upon some careful consideration. We are looking to start in Staten Island and Queens. Oh, <laughs> so now we know there's so many different areas in Queens. Um, do you have a specific uh, location for Queens? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, really we're looking to, you know, in terms of strategy um, to be as efficient as possible. Obviously, the, the you know, the current situation has, has drastically changed our initial plan, which was, you know, the traditional field work model where residents mm -hmm. physically going to these developments and connecting with, with residents and, and um, in that way. You know, now that we are moving more to telephonic outreach, I think that, you know, we're able to spread a little bit further. I mentioned that this, this was a team of six. So, you know, we are thinking of teams of sub teams of two um, who could focus on on some priority populations. When I say priority, everybody is is obviously a priority. I just mean in terms of where we might um, be able to cast the widest net. So I think the Queensbridge area um, would be one of our one of our key targets, but we want to be really mindful of where there are already efforts centered, so that we can space out um, our work. But definitely, um, we do, no development is going to be neglected. We are going to ensure that we are reaching out to everybody. And again, because we're able to do this telephonically. Um, and remotely, it allows us to to sort of do that concurrently as opposed to one at a time. Does that does that help answer your question? Great. Yes, it does. Thank you. Sure. So I think we can move on to our uh, larger panel QA right now, and um, hopefully Councilman Levine will join us at some point. I know he's very busy. Um, and Grace Hillier from the community outreach arm of the Columbia Cancer Center will be helping to moderate this panel discussion. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists to please show your videos if you can. And I will put you on to leave. I, I can't because uh, it says the hosts have stopped it. I see. Hi, thank you. I see uh, Mark Levine has joined, Councilman. Thank you so much for joining. I just, um, I'm so glad that you're able to join us tonight. I think we'll let um, Mark Levine um, speak. He, we have him slotted to speak with us for a little bit of time. He's very busy, but um, so thank you, Mark. Um, as many of you probably know, Mark Levine is a New York City Council member from the, the seventh district in Northern Manhattan. He also serves as the chair of uh, the Council Committee on Health, and he's also a member of the Progressive Caucus. He's a leader on many issues, including housing, education, economic justice, transportation, environmentalism, and more. And um, if you remember this past fall, Mark was the one to in, um, introduce legislation to ban uh, flavored e-cigarettes and um, in New York City. So Mark, thank you so much for joining. Um, we've just been discussing many different topics related to tobacco cessation, lung cancer screening, um, smoke-free housing, and we're so interested to hear from you. So. Are you uh, ready to join us? And well, 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 sure I am, Kimberly, and, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is just such a challenging time for our city and, and for the country. And, um, but, but the cause of tobacco cessation uh, mm -hmm. remains quite critical. Uh, I know we all have heavy hearts right now um, because of the loss of so many of our fellow New Yorkers over the past uh, two to three months now, uh, approaching 22,000 who have died from coronavirus. And uh, uh, we're particularly pained by the number of healthcare workers who are amongst those who have died. And, and now compounding uh, that pain is uh, the, the horrible, horrible killing of George Floyd, 
and uh, so many others who preceded him, uh, uh, black people in New York and, and around the country who have been uh, victims of police violence. And I know that's not directly our topic today, but uh, it's on all of our minds. And um, uh, Keisha, who is uh, on, it looks like I'm under the name Keisha Smith. I should fix that. But she's my staff member who alerted me uh, that you all wanted to observe a moment of silence. Is that right? If so, uh, I'd be happy to lead you in that for a moment to remember uh, those that we've lost in this pandemic, first responders and healthcare workers and frontline workers and, and George Floyd and countless other victims of another epidemic, uh, the epidemic of racism in America. And so I'd like everyone to, to observe a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Um, I'm going to change my name here so you can know who you're talking to. And we have 11 in the council, and I'm Levine. Uh, common, commonly confused, but Steve Levin is a good friend. I'm always happy to be confused with him. Um, I, I, I do want to talk about the topic at hand. Um, and this week, every year, uh, New York City, no tobacco week is important. And I'm glad you didn't cancel it because of the pandemic. Arguably, this fight is more important than ever. Uh, even before this horrible pandemic, um, doctors commonly would say that quitting smoking is the single best thing you can do for your body and for your health. And that remains true today. But I believe that the pandemic only highlights the urgency of this cause. and. Forgive me if you've already discussed this, but I want to address a misconception out there that I think is dangerous, that smoking protects you from COVID-19. Have you discussed this yet? No, no. Okay. Um, you know, there were some early reports out of China that fueled this, that smokers were underrepresented amongst those who were dying from COVID-19 in that country. And boy, that story seemed to, to, to uh, run around the world pretty quick, um, quite dangerously. And plenty of scientists have now poked holes in that by point, pointing out something really obvious, which is that COVID-19 overwhelmingly impacts people who are older, um, really old, over, the, over 75, is, is the, the highest risk age category. And for a variety of reasons, there are fewer smokers at that age. One of the most painful reason, but one we have to address, is that smokers don't tend to live as long. And so there aren't as many who've made it to 75 or 80 or 85, and therefore aren't today dying of coronavirus. But everything we understand about lung disease and diseases like the flu, other respiratory diseases, is that smoking makes you far more susceptible and means that if you do get sick, you'll have a more serious case. And as we've understood more about coronavirus, that view has taken hold um, amongst doctors and scientists. But it's so hard to undo uh, misinformation. And when I talk to folks, I think most of them have still absorbed uh, those uh, now, now understood to be flawed reports from earlier in this crisis. So you as activists who are talking to people who are trying to get sm quit smoking, I hope you're delivering this message. Uh, it really is more important to quit than ever. Uh, this pandemic has also driven home the painful inequality of healthcare medical care in this country, which has driven higher fatality rates in communities of color. And um, unfortunately, there are inequalities in smoking as well, um, driven in part by uh, the flavors of cigarettes which are available. Um, 
uh, including uh, menthol, which is hooking kids and hooking African Americans at disproportionate rates. And so we've been pushing in the council uh, a multi-front effort to eliminate flavors for e-cigarettes, and I'm proud we've done that. Uh, first big city in America to do that back in December. Um, vindicated, I would say, by uh, clear elevated risk in the pandemic due to vaping. And um, there's a second bill whose lead sponsor is council member uh, Cabrera from the Bronx, uh, my colleague who has been leading this fight. Um, it's really important to continue to help people with smoking cessation, even now, even though it's tough to reach people in person, um, folks aren't coming in for annual physicals, they're not coming in for doctor's appointments, and that's one venue where they could get medical advice about smoking. Um, we need to reach them via telemedicine, and we need to um, make sure they have the tools they need, the information they need to quit, even if they're home. And of course, we can send smoking cessation kits to people that give them some of the basic materials they need to, to start quit to quit. Um, it's tougher now um, because so many people are homebound and so much of the medical system is not currently working, but we have to do that. Um, of course, we're now about two years into the NYCHA ban, uh, a ban which applies not only in, in, in people's apartments and common areas, but actually 25 feet from any NYCHA building. And there's uh, a, a slow but increasing movement to ban smoking in private buildings. A number of co-ops have taken this measure. So honestly, I think this is probably the best time to quit smoking ever because of what we understand about the risk, of the financial benefits of not spending that money, of the dangers in the middle of a pandemic of a respiratory virus, of new laws and new rules that are impacting where people live. Let's do this now. And I wanna thank everybody who's highlighting this issue, who's reaching out to community groups working on this. And I want you to know that you have me as a full partner, as chair in the city council in this fight. Um, even though these are tough times to do this work. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Mark. That's so um, such a wonderful, and you, you hit so many points that are important to us and that we've, you know, been thinking about and discussing. And I think it's so important to highlight, you know, how different communities are being disproportionately impacted, especially now. And smoking, as you said, just compounds the issue. So um, we do have, you know, if, if anyone who is tuning in, we do see um, some questions coming in in our QA. So if you don't mind, Mark, if I ask you. Sure. This, question. Um, this question is, what's the latest on getting CC Chair Johnson to allow the sales ban on menthol cigarettes in New York City to be brought up for a vote? Yes. Um, this is uh, Corey Johnson, who's a speaker of the city council and a real health champion. He was actually my predecessor uh, as chair of the health committee in the last term. Um, and I've talked to him a lot about this and he really believes in this. Uh, he, uh, to his credit, um, helped move through uh, the, the menthol, excuse me, the flavored e-cigarette ban. Um, and prior to the onset of this horrible pandemic, uh, council leadership, was in pretty deep discussions on the menthol ban bill, which I mentioned is chaired by Councilmember Cabrera. Um, really trying to work through the criminal justice angle. Um, and I think all of you understand that. Uh, we wouldn't want this to be uh, an excuse for over-aggressive enforcement in communities of color. Uh, I think you also, uh, like I do, believe that, that that absolutely can be avoided and that that should not stop us from taking that action. Um, we just have to be smart about it. Um, and, you know, remind folks that this is a ban on the sale of those products. It's not a ban on the possession. This isn't the kind of thing that if an officer finds in your backpack is gonna be any liability for you. Uh, this is really about merchants. Um, it's a very different equation. Um, so 
I, I'll reconnect with the speaker's office on this. I, I, I think you understand that in the last uh, couple of months, we've been pretty consumed by coronavirus, but you know, the broader health fight continues. And uh, as I mentioned before, is arguably more urgent than ever. Wonderful. Grace, did you want to ask the next question? Sure, sure. Uh, there was a second part to that question. Um, when the nitrous smoke-free mandate became effective, it was a great public health milestone for New York City residents. Shouldn't those who live in non-subsidized apartment buildings have the same free amenity? Voluntary smoke-free policy transition is not fast enough. Yes, and uh, I'm not sure if the question uh, is implying something I might not have been aware of. So private private buildings don't have the legal authority to pass such bans. Is that right? Was that, I might uh, be the, the person is saying, shouldn't those who live in non-subsidized apartment buildings have the same free amenity? Sure, in other words, that co-ops and condos and privately owned rental housing. Right. Uh, yes, uh, I, and I believe that they have, uh, they should, and I believe that they have that, uh, the, the, the legal uh, uh, authority to do so. And I, I've understood that some have started to. Uh, it's interestingly, if I'm not mistaken, tended to be higher end buildings. And that potentially um, reinforces inequality here again. Um, and uh, we, wouldn't want, we wouldn't want it only to be those who can afford uh, big rents or big co-op uh, maintenance payments to, uh, to have this uh, protection. Um, so I'd, I'd like to do work with you to see how widely spread it is and whether indeed um, uh, there, there is this kind of inequality right now. Thank you. Let's see. Um, I had a, uh, a question for, uh, for Caitlin. Um, if, oh, there's Caitlin. Uh, you were talking about your uh, NYC treats tobacco uh, being available to anybody throughout the city. I was wondering if you could elaborate that on that a little bit more. How would, if somebody was interested in smoking, uh, in cessation, uh, quitting smoking based on our conversation tonight, can they go to their doctor? Where, what exactly do they need to do to, uh, to become smoke free? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, there's a few different routes that someone can take if they are interested in quitting, quitting smoking. Um, I had my email up earlier and I'm happy to throw it in the chat. Anyone is happy, I'm happy to field any questions after this as well. Um, one of the main things that you're going to want to do is first contact your primary care provider. Um, they of course have your history, they know your smoking history, so it's great to connect with them. Um, there's a really good, currently there's a good chance that you won't be able to see your doctor in person, which is where that telehealth piece comes in. Um, NYC quits the, if you just Google NYC quits, several resources will come up and there's actually a brochure that lists all of the cessation centers in New York City. Most of them are health and hospitals uh, locations. Mm -hmm. um, and there's several designated sites that are organized by cost. So you can see kind of if it's no cost, low cost, um, a lot of them are offering telemedicine um, for smoking cessation. You do have to call ahead though, just to make sure because a lot of them did turn into a COVID testing site. That's terrific. Then anybody can reach out to this, uh, go to your website and find that information and be able to uh, get connected to, to tobacco cessation services. Um, Absolutely. And I'll throw my email in the uh, group chat on uh, the Zoom so that everybody, anybody can reach out to me with any individual questions regarding where to go. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. wonderful. Uh, I also had a, a question for Pat. Um, I think some people know this, other people don't know it. You were talking about this being a journey. Of, of how many times does a person have to quit before they quit for good? Thank you, um, Dr. Hillier. That's a great question. I think sometimes I know for myself, I'm very leery to say it takes more than once because there are, and we all know people mm -hmm. that said, I quit cold turkey. I never went back. I didn't use anything. 
So that's, it goes back to what I mentioned in the presentation. I think everybody has to pick their own path. For some people, they're very determined. They know what they need to do and they can implement it. Other people need additional support. You know, the research shows that most people take more than one attempt to be successful. However, you can be successful the first time. You need to also remember that if you're not successful the first time, don't compare yourself with how other people are doing it mm -hmm. to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. Pick what works best for you. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going to take the one day at a time approach. I'm going to even break it down smaller than that. I might have to take one minute at a time. Whatever works for you. And that's why it's important to add the quit line, 1866NYQuits, to your list of resources. Because when you are having a difficult time, pick up the phone and talk to your coach. I think all of us know that when we're stressed and we have the opportunity to talk to someone, you automatically feel better. You feel like you've just gotten something off your shoulders and you can move on. There's a saying, I, I worked in addictions for over 20 years and, and a saying that we've often used is, this too shall pass. You know, sometimes we just have to kind of let that work through that craving, let it pass and then we can get through it because quitting you know, as Caitlin mentioned, isn't just about the physical addiction. There's making behavioral changes, habitual changes, psychological changes, also emotional changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why for some people, like I said, it may work the first time and other people it may take, you know, five, seven or more attempts. The important thing to remember is don't compare yourself. You are your own unique person and work with what's best for you and what you know works for you. That's really good advice, thank you. I have a question, um, thank you, Pat. Councilman Levine, um, would you favor more anti-tobacco programs in New York City schools? And do you think that the New York City Cancer Centers play a role in that, in that education in schools? Well, I sure hope they do, and we, we need to reach kids uh, before they start smoking. Uh, it's much easier to not start than it is to quit once you're uh, in the grips of this addiction. Um, and unfortunately, uh, kids often start young, um, high school and tragically even middle school. So the education should probably start uh, in late elementary school and continue to older kids. But, um, but it's going to be easier to reach people, I think, uh, in the younger grades. And uh, we, we, need, we need to do more tobacco education and the Cancer Center should be part of that for sure. It's, it's uh, Fred Hirsch, if I can amplify. Um, I mentioned that and I emphasize exactly that during my presentation. And I, I do believe also that um, cancer centers, academic institutions, uh, and organizations to counter do much better job in in the education of younger younger uh, emphasize enough and support enough what Mark is saying. Can you hear me? A little. Yeah. You're breaking up a bit, Dr. Hirsch. I think your audio and there we see you again. I think your audio froze a bit there. Yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm, I emphasized that during my presentation as well about the education, educational aspects, and I think we we need to come together and do a better job. Well, cancer centers, academic centers, communities, go, going into the schools. Uh, it is in the younger age, everything starts. And so just to and, add- and, and, it, and, it, and it starts with, these days it often starts with e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, e-cigarettes by itself seems, uh, seems to be dangerous, but I think, my personal 
um, opinion is it is culturally and psychologically easy to move from e-cigarettes to real cigarettes and um, that needs to be emphasized. Just to add on to that, um, Councilman Levine, we at the Columbia Cancer Center have designed a curriculum that's been taught in a few uh, local middle and high schools in Northern Manhattan, Staten Island and the South Bronx covering five things teens can do now to lower their risk for cancer later. And if, you, if we could get your support signing on to that um, so that we can get it into more schools and through the DOE, um, that would be wonderful for us because we are trying to get to youth at an earlier age to talk to them about what they can do now um, to lower their risk later on. And you know, avoiding smoking is definitely one of those um, behaviors. I'd love to help with that. Thank you, that's great. Let's see. Grace, did you have any other questions on your list? Um, I was thinking about lung cancer screening. Um, we, uh, Dr. Hirsch has uh, talked about all of the, uh, the science that has gone into the, the recommendation for lung cancer screening. I would suspect that a lot of people don't realize that lung cancer screening is available and don't quite understand what the procedure is, that it's a, it's a, a CAT scan test, that it's done annually. And it's done for people who have a, uh, a heavy smoking history between the ages of 55 and 74. Uh, where can people go for that? They would have to have a history of smoking one pack a day for 30 years or the equivalent, so a 30-pack year history. Uh, Dr. Hirsch, where at, uh, do you know of that people can go to have uh, lung cancer screening to be evaluated? I know that there's a process for making a decision to screen and where they can... Um, then go and have this, uh, this CAT scan done? Yeah, I will say that um, on, on this stage, uh, the best communication and the best direction would be through the uh, primary healthcare provider. Uh, I think that uh, will be the, the first step. Uh, there are hospitals who offer lung cancer screening and they can, of course, contact uh, hospitals directly uh, and, and, and talk with, with the managers of screening programs. Mount Sinai uh, has a very extensive screening program. Uh, many other uh, net health networks have as well. Um, so, uh, but uh, as I said, my hope is the future will bring lung cancer screening out to the population, not the population to the screening. Uh, I think that uh, is where the best um, penetration pilot programs uh, using a mobile, mobile van uh, approaches and going out to libraries and uh, uh, religious communities, et cetera, et cetera. But they are all pilot programs. They are not right. implemented in the, in, the, in the routine healthcare. So uh, the, the answer to your question is mainly through your primary healthcare provider and get the guidance and direction there. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's uh, important for people to know. I have one last question. Well, I probably could think of a dozen other questions, but I had one for, for Jody. Uh, why do you think the smoking rates are so high in Staten Island? Do you, <laughs> do you have an idea what's going that's on it. over there? I am, you know, that's a really interesting question, Ben, and I think it's one that um, requires a few more folks at the table. Um, certainly, you know, I, I don't have any specific data to offer you from the from the NYCHA perspective as to as to why the rates overall for Staten Island are higher. I do think that there is probably um, one of the factors is that Staten Island tends to be the I, I hate to say, but sometimes the forgotten borough um, and resources tend to be more concentrated. We see especially in Manhattan and the other other boroughs. Um, so there 
perhaps that, that might be a, a cause is, is maybe lesser access. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why we wanted to focus on Staten Island first because of the disproportionately high prevalence rate of almost about 24%. Um, you know, as compared to 16, 17% that we see in the other boroughs. Um, you know, it's a good question. We hope that through our work, we'll be able to learn more. I do know that it's something that our, the local health clinics, such as Vanderbilt Clinic, the H&H &H, um, site are, are eager to, to take on and, and, and to work with us on, on engaging residents in, in quitting tobacco use. But certainly it's, it's worth exploring and, and, and we should have a better understanding as to why that community is seeing a higher prevalence rate. Another question that came in um, was that um, if, if any of the panelists know, what are the rights of tenants in private buildings when your neighbor smokes and it comes into your apartment? What, what are the things that people can do that you know of? Anyone? <laughs> um, I guess, I don't know. I think that that's probably something you'd, you'd probably have to take up with building management. If, you're, if your building has a tenant association, that, that could be a place to bring it up. Um, but I mean, the first thing, maybe just having that initial friendly conversation with the person, if that were possible. I don't think there are concrete resources right now for private buildings. As um, Councilman Mark Levine said, it's kind of a building, a, building by building basis that some buildings choose to go smoke free, but um, that is a, an issue that is important and um, something for all of us to think about. Um, I think that we are, oh. Sorry, I would just add, I would just add that a, a potential resource might be the community partnership um, grantees from the state who, who do work on, on smoke free issues. Caitlin um, can definitely speak more to which individuals would be the right points of contact, but it's really great that there is um, a, a point of contact in each of the five boroughs. So depending on where um, the individual lives, I think that we would be able to put them in touch with the, with the right folks. Caitlin, would you, would you add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I was gonna jump in. Um, Part of the state funding, I work, of course, on more of the healthcare end, but there is a community end as well, and that include one of their deliverables includes smoke-free housing, more on the private side versus public. Um, I don't know too, too much, unfortunately, but I do know it does vary from building to building. One thing I've heard them say quite often is to check the lease agreement um, that you have, um, and talk to your building manager, see what can be done before you take any real kind of drastic action. Um, however, NYC Smoke Free, um, they are, again, as Jody said, there's someone in each borough um, that specifically works in the buildings in that area. Um, so I would 100% direct you. I know they're a partner, um, so you'll be able to find them on the website that you use to sign up for this webinar. Um, but depending on your borough, you can reach out to whoever um, is available and they'd be more than happy to assist you with navigating that conversation. Great, thank you. And we'll be sure to include all of those resources in a follow-up email to all attendees. Um, I'm seeing people also say to call 311. So I think that we've covered a lot of ground tonight, but I just wanted to give um, each panelist a moment if they'd like to just say a final comment before we close and also um, we just want to thank you all the panelists and all the attendees for joining us tonight. Um, it's so important to raise this issue, especially now and we're just very appreciative of your time and attention to this. So um, Caitlin, do you want to add one last comment? We'll go around. Sure, yeah, I just wanna of course thank you to the panelists and everyone who's attending. I know these are definitely unprecedented times and unsure times, but I think that this is also a great opportunity to take the time for yourself to 
make that jump to quitting. Um, but you have a, you have the extra time, you have a little more freedom in terms of controlling what you can and can't um, do. So I think it's definitely a great opportunity using all of the resources um, that were provided here. The panelists were really great in kind of guiding you through some resources. So I'd absolutely take advantage of those and feel free. My email is in the chat. So feel free to reach out with any other questions I can answer. Thank you. Jody. Sorry. I'm new. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, sorry, a little bit of a delay in, in unmuting. Um, I just wanted to say that echo Caitlin's remarks. I think this has been um, a really important conversation and I think it's highlighted um, a lot of the wonderful resources that are that are really tangible to us right now. I, I know we at NYCHA um, rely heavily on the quit line as a wonderful uh, resource to our residents as well as the local clinics. But I do think that as Pat said and, and Caitlin's echo too, this is really a process um, and that we shouldn't be afraid to take those steps and, and really to remember that, that the information is on our side. The majority of us need help to quit um, but the good news is, and the great news is, is that the resources are there and in plenty in, in the city. So I'm wishing everyone the best. And again, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy um, during this time. And I look forward to when we can all actually meet again in person. Thank you. Thank you. I have to jump off as well. I'm late for the next Zoom. Thank you so much for including me and to everyone out there trying to quit. You can do it, and we're here to help. Now's the time. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Dr. Hirsch, do you have a last comment for us? Um, well, as a medical doctor focusing on uh, lung cancer, uh, of course, uh, that will be my, my focus. And uh, it is, unfortunately, uh, causing uh, more than 160,000 deaths per year in the United States. Lung cancer is <coughs> preventable. We believe that uh, at least 80% of lung cancers are caused by uh, sm uh, tobacco smoking. And I cannot emphasize enough uh, education uh, in younger age uh, for uh, those uh, health uh, risks and uh, preventive uh, measures for uh, not smoke, uh, not going into smoking. Lung cancer screening reduce lung cancer mortality with 20 to 30 uh, percent, which is significant in in the high risk group and should be. Uh, focus much more on. So uh, that would be my uh, my last comments. I could uh, say the same about heart diseases. Uh, of course, that is not my speciality, but uh, we know uh, smoking is causing severe heart diseases as well. So um, altogether, don't smoke. Quit while it, while it is time for it. Thank you. Thank you. And Pat, thank you for joining us. And do you have last uh, words today? Well, thank you very much. Just to echo what everyone else has already said, it really has been an honor to be part of this prestigious panel. And I just want to say a couple things. First of all, tomorrow we will have another representative of our quit line, Bethania Nunez Rodriguez, who is one of our excellent bilingual supervisors, and she'll be presenting our resources in Spanish. And I also just want to remind everyone of something that I like to often reflect upon, and that's a saying that anonymous saying, we can't always change the wind, but we can adjust our sails. So if you have tried to quit before and you said, I don't think I can do this, you can do this, as Mark had mentioned. And this is an opportune time to change your, adjust your sales and to try something different. And you can start by using the wonderful resources in New York City and across the state and at the quit line, one eight six six ny quit So we hope to hear from you. And even if you just call because you want to say hello and let us know know if you are smoke free how you're doing it share your story we all have a story so please 
feel free to share that with us. And thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tobacco free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat, and thank you to all the panelists. I do have um, an exit poll that I'm going to launch now. I'm going to ask all the attendees to please, if you don't mind filling that out before you leave tonight, and um, do check out our website and the other resources. We'll be sending those around later today. So thank you so much, and um, have a good evening. Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one.